Hello and welcome to The Hill's 2024 GOP primary debate breakdown. I'm Michael Schnell. And I'm Rafael Bernal. Last night, eight presidential hopefuls took the stage in Milwaukee to make the case that they should be the Republican presidential nominee. Former President Donald Trump, who is leading in the polls, chose not to participate in the event. He instead sat down with Tucker Carlson for an interview that aired at the same time. So we want to get right into what happened last night, and our colleague Julia Manchester is joining us now from Wisconsin. So Julia, you were in the spin room during and after the debate. So what was the mood like last night? Yeah, look, I think the mood was certainly going into it of anticipation. We didn't really know what was going to happen because remember guys, as all of this was happening, had all the drama unfolding in Fulton County, Georgia, as former President Trump prepares to turn himself in. And then you also had former President Trump at the same time sitting down with former Fox News host Tucker Carlson on his um, you know, for, for another interview. So we had a number of different stories sort of happening at the same time. So we didn't know what to expect. Now, for The Hill, I primarily cover Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. And to be honest, I was pretty surprised uh, that he didn't make as big of a splash during last night's debate. We were really anticipating the other candidates to go after him, to target him, for him to try to have a number of breakout moments. But largely, he tried to stay out of the fray, had a few strong moments when he uh, did speak, but largely he sort of faded into the background. And part of that may be because you know his campaign wants to play it safe. It's been a rocky road for them. But I was shocked to see that. Um, you know, but Vivek Ramaswamy, I think you know, as our colleague Niall Stanage wrote last night, I think there's a lot of mixed reactions to his performance. I, you know, was chatting with some sources who talked about how he really came off as annoying, sort of condescending, sort of that annoying kid in your AP history class, um, know-it-all kind of thing. But at the same time, he, uh, you know, ultimately was able to get a lot of screen time and uh, very much faced off against former Vice President Mike Pence. And Mike Pence, I would say, also had a very good night. He's been trailing in the polls, hasn't gotten a ton of coverage for a former vice president, but he was able to really jump into the fray and stand out. Look, Julia, you've been covering this race very closely, of course, especially, as you mentioned, DeSantis. Debates sometimes give some candidates a bump. Sometimes they don't really move the needle in an election. In your opinion, do you think that this debate will move the needle at all? Of course, DeSantis is leading the pack behind former President Trump. Vivek Ramaswamy is behind him. Mike Pence behind him there. Both had some interesting evenings, while DeSantis didn't. Do you think that this will make a dent at all in the polls and shake up the race? Yeah, I think it certainly has the potential to, and we've seen that in past election cycles. I don't know if this will necessarily be a deciding factor going down the line. There's obviously more debates to be had. There's more campaign events to be had. Lots can happen between now and January when the Iowa caucuses take place. But, you know, I think we could definitely see a shift in the polls because, remember, this is the first time a lot of Americans got um, really their first look at all of these candidates on stage. You know, the three of us covered this stuff all day. Um, you know, we, we are very much in the weeds. But the average American isn't necessarily paying attention to what's happening every day in Iowa or New Hampshire or South Carolina. So this was their first look at it. Um, and we can't pass me is a lot of these candidates sometimes get sugar highs after um, you know, a debate. If they perform particularly well, we see them um, you, you know, see a little bump in the polls, maybe a bump in favorability. But that can all change depending on what happens with another candidate um, or what happens um, you know, on the campaign trail. So I think that it definitely has the potential to somewhat move the needle. So th there's two things you're, that you're saying that uh, that I'm very interested in. Um, there's that Trump taking the air out of the room uh, that that obviously happened on stage as well as off stage, and then this sort of uh, sugar high that that candidates get after a really good or or the the low they get after a really bad performance. What did you what did you feel in the spin room before the debate and after the debate? Did did. Did they talk more about Trump after or before, and and who who looked who looked better after the debate? So I think we were talking about Trump, you know, before the debate and after the debate, and those in the spin room were doing the same as well. In fact, the Trump campaign 
could argue, um, you know, very cleverly and, and a smart move, sent quite a few surrogates to the spin room and to Milwaukee this week. Jason Miller, Stephen Chung on his comms team, Congressman Matt Gates, Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene, to talk about Donald Trump and make sure that even though Donald Trump wasn't physically physically present there, present there, he was there in a way. And you saw them giving their take on the spin spin room floor. I mean, I thought it was interesting that Congressman Matt Gates was praising Vivek Ramaswamy for his performance. Performance. It seems like there's, uh, it almost appears like there's a closeness between those two camps. Ramaswamy oftentimes jumping at any opportunity to praise the former president. At the same time, though, I thought what was interesting during the debate was that during the first half of the debate, we didn't hear Trump's name that much. Um, it was very much focused on these candidates and their platforms and their policies, which I think was a very good move on, you know, Brett Baer and Mark McCallum's part. I thought they did a fantastic job with the questioning, got really into the substance and did a good job at you know, keeping this as substantive as possible. Now, further on into the debate, obviously, you know, as Brett Baer said, you have to address the uh, literal elephant in the room, Donald Trump, or figure development in the room, Donald Trump. Um, and I thought it was so incredibly telling that I think uh, six out of the eight candidates on stage, I think Chris Christie sort of shook his fist, you know, or uh, did something with his hand, but they raised their hand when asked, would they support Donald Trump if he was the 2024 nominee, even if he was convicted of a crime? That just shows how big of a presence he has in this primary, you know, whether or not he's on the debate stage and how tight of a grip he has on this party. Julia, one candidate I want to ask you about who we haven't discussed yet is former U.N. ambassador and South Carolina governor Nikki Haley. She was, of course, the only woman there on stage, and she's been polling behind, but she's the one who jumped into this race earliest of the candidates on stage very early this year. I found it pretty interesting that she was the first person to go after former President Trump, criticizing him for uh, the, the dollar number that was added to uh, that that was added to the national debt. And then at one point she called, uh, I believe, Donald Trump the most unfair favorable politician in America. Uh, tell me what you thought of Nikki Haley's debate performance, particularly it was that exchange with Vivek Ramaswamy that caught a lot of eyes on foreign policy, obviously something that she comes to the table with. And just, you know, I want to touch on her because, of course, she was the only woman on stage, which I think is, you know, an important aspect to touch upon. And I know that you've done a lot of reporting about female politicians. Yeah, it's so important. And I think she had a very, very good night. Um, she didn't necessarily jump into the fray the same way Vivek Ramaswamy or Mike Pence did, or maybe even Chris Christie. But she really was on brand because she campaigned with the, this message of, I'm going to be the only woman in the room, the only adult in the room. I'm going to let these men be boys, essentially. And I thought that was very much on brand. Last night, she had a very strong quote at one point when, um, you know, a number of the male candidates were bickering and she said, um, you know, invoked Margaret Thatcher and, um, you know, women leadership. And I thought that was very, very um, strong on her part. And I thought her, take down, I, I would call it takedown in a way, of Vivek Ramaswamy was very, very, um, you know, impactful. I don't think foreign policy is a major, um, you know, issue that voters go to the polls and vote on. It's obviously an issue she's strong on. But Ramaswamy was very much trying to, you know, take advantage of the screen time he was getting during the debate. He was being the loudest in the room. And I think her comment, in a way, sort of shut him down. And, um, you know, I, I think just showed her strength as a debater. Um, her campaign has been interesting because they have. She hasn't really seen a lot of traction in the polls, like a Ramaswamy, um, you know, or obviously a former President Trump. But you know, her allies tell me that she's taking a slow and steady approach. That a lot can happen between now and January. She's being consistent. She's going to Iowa, New Hampshire, obviously South Carolina, former governor of that state, and just meeting with voters in smaller groups and slowly building this coalition. I think her strategy of, in a way, going after former President Trump was very, um, you know, clever as well because she's making the electability argument. She's trying to sit, look to a Republican audience and a Republican base and say, "Look, guys, I served in the Trump administration. I, you know, supported this guy, but we have to win in 2024." 
and she's arguing he's not an electable candidate. We'll see if that plays well in the with the base, the hardcore MAGA base. I would assume it doesn't. But I would imagine that a lot of independent voters, a lot of maybe some Republican voters who aren't sure about who to support, who are sick of Trump, they're going to like to hear that. We have about 20 seconds. Let's get into everyone else. Did, uh, did Tim Scott, uh, was, his, was his performance as bad as a lot, of, uh, a lot of reviews are coming in? And people like Asa Hutchinson, he reminded me of uh, being a middle schooler watching uh, Republican presidential debates in the early 90s. Um, did, did anybody stand out, out of, except for the, uh, the, uh, the candidates we've already talked about? Yeah, I think Tim Scott. Uh, in particular, I mean, look, he was, I, I thought he did a fine job with his presentation, but he, he, you sort of forgot he was there sometimes. I mean, he had a few good moments, but he wasn't really stealing the show. And it was hard for a lot of these candidates to, you know, speak over someone like a Vivek Ramaswamy or Mike Pence really dominated the stage. Doug Burgum obviously made it despite uh, having an injury the night before. I thought Chris Christie had a good night, um, you know, had, really showed off his debate chops, and I thought he did very well. He faces an uphill climb, though, because he's so, um, you know, never Trump at this point. Well, Julia, thank you so much for joining us from Wisconsin, and uh, enjoy the cheese curds, I guess. <laughs> thank you. Well, this morning, uh, President Trump praised Vivek Ramaswamy's debate performance. So on Truth Social, he referenced his, Vivek's own praise of a former president, saying, and I quote, this answer gave Vivek Ramaswamy a big win in the debate because of a thing called truth. Now, according to Twitter, President Trump's interview with Tucker Carlson garnered more than 74 million views. But it's important to note that Fox News has not yet released its numbers yet, and Twitter counts all views on its platform, including if you just scroll past the video. So joining us now for more analysis on all of this is Democratic strategist and founding partner of Northern Star Strategies, Michael Starr Hopkins, and Sarah Chamberlain, president and CEO of Republican Man Street Partnership and founder of the Women to Women Conversations Tour. Welcome both. Thank Thanks for having us. So Sarah, uh, this was a Republican debate, so I want to start with you. Yeah. Uh, I, I think expectations were highest of Vivek Ramaswamy and Ron DeSantis coming in just because of their position on the, on the polls. Um, we theoretically knew what, what Ron DeSantis' plan was going to be because of all these leaked memos. Uh, do, do you feel Ron DeSantis stuck to that plan as we knew it? He did, um, but I don't think it was a good plan. I do not think he had a good debate at all. Um, he kind of stood there. He did not act as if he was the leader of that group. Um, our Personally, the one who uh, is pulling better in the Republican Main Street Partnership vote, um, Paul Vivek, really commanded the stage where it should have been the governor from Florida. So it was a fascinating uh, evening last night. And Michael, I guess we'll go to you. We can go to you and see, you know, who do you think did the best on the stage? Who do you think underperformed? And, it, you know, you're from the strategist from the other side of the aisle. What did you think of DeSantis' strategy going in? And A, did he follow through with that? And B, was it successful? Yeah, I'll start off with Ron DeSantis. Uh, I've had, I don't know if I'd call it the pleasure, uh, but I've gone up against Ron DeSantis in two campaigns that I've consulted on. Uh, he is a horrible debater. That's just kind of who he is. He's very stiff. He's very scriptive. And that came off last night in his kind of over-caffeinated, uh, extremely campaign-style uh, performance. I think the debate in total, there wasn't really a winner. Yeah, Vivek got a lot of the attention, but the more attention he gets, the more scrutiny he's going to get. And I think Chris Christie uh, put a lot of pressure on him when he talked about his comments in his book. We're now going to see reporters going back, looking at comments that Vivek has made over time. They're questioned about whether uh, he said that we shouldn't support Israel. So while Vivek may seem like he was the one who got the most attention, I actually think in the long run, he's going to be the biggest loser of that debate. So, Sarah, I, I guess uh, responding to that, there, there is that Vivek um, channeled Trump in a lot of ways, but obviously doesn't have the power that Trump has to set the conversation. He, he seems a little bit, he's, he's saying the things that Trump would say. Is, is that a better, a better strategy for this first debate or more of the, say, Nikki Haley strategy of, being, of showing more general election electability? 
Okay, so I would actually love to put the two of them together and create one person. I think what he did, he fires up the base. It's very important. He cannot get to a general election unless he has the base. Um, what we're finding in our polling is suburban women like him. Um, so he's got to get through the base, fire everybody up to get to the general. And then I think he has a really good shot against, uh, against uh, President Biden. Nikki Haley, I thought, did a wonderful job. Um, she's kind of quiet, but she's thoughtful. She, her uh, comments were right on. The problem is that does not play for a primary. That plays more for the general. Um, so it's interesting, the two of them and, and their different strategies. It's almost like one would be a great president, one would be a great uh, vice president. Um, but I thought Nikki Haley did a wonderful job. Um, and actually, to be honest, a little bit better than I was anticipating, uh, because as, as your last guest said, she has started a slow campaign, um, but she certainly picked up traction last night. Sarah, I want to pick up on something you just said, um, that, you know, the candidates need the base. They need to have this Republican base, which has really turned into a conglomerate of Trump supporters and people who are in favor of former President Trump. So when you look on that debate stage, there were a number of jabs made at former President Trump. You saw that from Nikki Haley. Uh, you saw that from Mike Pence during the January 6th conversation, of course, from Chris Christie. So in, in your opinion, from being a Republican strategist and advising some of these campaigns, you know, in Republican campaigns in general, having an intimate knowledge of how they work, do you think that that them sort of trying to talk to maybe some never Trump voters? or people who are still Republicans but not so sure with former President Trump. Do you think that just sort of counts them out of this primary overall? It doesn't help them, certainly. And you can see that reflected in the polls. Um, our polling at Republican Main Street Partnership, of course, says Trump first, but Vivek is, is a very strong second. Um, again, we right now, they've got to be pulling the Trump voters away from Donald Trump. In order to do that is you have to do what Vivek did last night. You know, Nikki Haley ran a great general uh, debate. Uh, Vivek ran a primary debate, and that's just the difference between the two. And whether we like it or not as a party, that is where our party is. And we need to get, in order to get to the to the general, we have got to get through a primary. And and I would say, you know, we talk about the, the more um, mainstream Republicans, but they're not voting in the primaries, and that's a problem. So the people who are voting in the primaries, we have to go out and appeal to in order to get to the general. And that's what happened last night. Let me add to that real quick, because I think what Republicans are doing, the biggest problem is while running for a primary, they're doing nothing to position themselves for a general. All they're doing in this primary is creating attack ads for Democrats. And it's really going to create a problem in the long run. You know, you had Vivek stand on stage and say that climate change is a hoax. You had candidates stand on stage and say that they would support a ban on abortion, both federal and some flip flopped on whether they would support state bans. It, this isn't something that's going to bring in independents and suburban voters. And so when you look at the polls, you see Trump uh, losing to President Biden now by six. There's no candidate in the primary that's going to pull away from Trump voters. So the question is going to be, what do you do when you have this large group of Republicans who are diehard Trump voters who likely aren't going to support someone else? And then heading into a general, if Trump isn't the nominee, likely either aren't going to vote are going to protest vote. It, so, Republicans have put themselves in a position where it's political suicide. So, so Michael, I'm, you, I'm you, actually not seeing that. I'm sorry. I'm not seeing that in our polling. Um, the abortion issue that was discussed last night, yes, the, the majority of the people that we polled, including suburban women, want it to be a state issue. But if it's not a state issue, they support the European ban on abortion, which is 17 weeks. 71% so, um, of the people we polled support a national ban on abortion at 17 weeks. On, on um, this so point, on, that on, is something that is playing well and that, that will play well in the general. Um, the also, you know, Vivek talked about mental health. That's a huge issue out there for suburban women. Again, that will play well in the general election against Joe Biden. On this point of, of, of general election electability, Michael, I, I, you, you sort of preempted my question there. But, I mean, we, we had, yes, the, the hoax comment was, uh, 
very strong. I do assume that is going to show up in, uh, in, in Democratic ads in the future. Um, the bombing Mexico idea, you know, bombing our biggest trade partner, that, that, that was a, there was very little pushback on those. But of the candidates that you saw on stage, especially of the, of the viable candidates, um, which one gave Democrats less fodder to, to, to create those ads in the general election? You know, it's, I would probably say Tim Scott, just because his performance was forgettable. When you really go back and think about uh, what lines landed and who actually put out policy, the entire debate was pretty forgettable. Yeah, Vivek had some lines that people are going to laugh at and will go viral on Twitter, but most of the voters in America don't exist on Twitter. And so one of the big problems with what we saw on the debate last night was that debate was positioned purely for Twitter and Fox News. Well, you've got 300, maybe 250 million people in America who don't turn into Twitter, who don't turn into Fox News. And so when you have this echo chamber, you create a discussion that only exists in that echo chamber. And the problem is that the rest of America doesn't exist there. And so the longer you have the Viveks of the world, the DeSantis's of the world, Republicans are really going to have a problem because no one took heavy shots at Trump. Like you said, they were jabs, no haymakers. And Republicans can't run purely uh, as the second option to Trump. At some point, someone's going to have to take on Trump. And that's been Chris Christie. But like we saw in that debate stage, Chris Christie continuously got booed every time he did that. He's starting to rise in uh, New Hampshire, but I don't really see a world where Republicans embrace someone like him. Sarah, I want to ask you, uh, you know, on this topic of former President Trump and now bring in Mike Pence, former vice president. According to The New York Times, he had the most speaking time in last night's debate, which I think some people were perhaps a bit surprised of. He's typically a bit more reserved, um, you know, a bit quieter. But he came out swinging in last night's debate right there on the screen. He had the most speaking time. There was one part of the debate that I found very interesting when the moderators asked the candidates on stage if they think that Mike Pence did the right thing on January 6th. Of course, January 6th, a very polarizing topic, but framing the question in a way that would either approve or disapprove of what Mike Pence did on that day. And, and, and people, by and large, said that he did the right thing. I'm curious to know what you thought of that moment in the sense of focusing on Mike Pence. And then when we get back to that conversation of, you know, well, he needs to, you need to have the base to win the Republican nomination. Even someone like Ron DeSantis said that he doesn't have any beef with what Mike Pence did on January 6th. How do you think, see that playing out among a Republican electorate? I think most people, except the really far extreme, um, support what Mike Pence did on January 6th. Uh, January 6th, had a lot of members of Congress there. They certainly support what he did. Uh, he protected and stood up for the Constitution of the United States of America. I was pleased to see um, everybody uh, supporting what he did. Having said that, I, I don't think he will uh, end up being the nominee. I think he's going to have a tough time getting through the primaries. Um, even though they support what he did, they're, they're still angry that uh, he supposedly went against Donald Trump. So I think the Trump base will not be willing to vote for him. I think they're going to be working looking for another option if Trump uh, does go down with his criminal activity that he has uh, been indicted with. So, Sarah, on, on that point, I mean, there's at least one very mainstream Republican who does not support what Pence did. His name is Donald Trump. Um, right. do, do, you, do you see this, this debate as sort of the first, first in a series of reality shows to find Donald Trump's running mate? Some people do see it that way. And if that's the case... Yeah. Like, how can they how can they say they agree with with Pence, with what Pence did and then go on a ticket with Trump? Oh, I think that will all be forgotten when the time comes. I think whoever Trump picks, um, he'll forget that they supported uh, Mike Pence, if it's even Donald Trump. You know, I kind of agree at, at times with Chris Sununu that uh, maybe it's not going to be Trump or Biden. Um, it would be really nice to see the country move past 80 years men um, leading us. So we'll have to wait and see. But I, I do think whoever, if it's Trump, whoever he picks, he won't care that they supported Mike Pence. 
Michael, I want to just take us quickly to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, uh, whether or not the president was watching the debate, the debate closely. He was commenting in real time on Twitter. He had a couple wisecracks at one point saying what she said to something Nikki Haley mentioned about Republicans adding to the national debt. Um, but curiously, at the end of the debate, there was a statement put out by the campaign, not from President Biden, but from Vice President Kamala Harris. She's obviously taken a lot of fire from some of these Republican candidates. A lot of the Republican candidates have said that they're not running against Biden, but they're running against Kamala Harris. Curious what you thought of that strategy of the White House, of the Biden campaign putting out a statement from Kamala Harris when, of course, her poll numbers, her favorabilities have been down, and some have questioned if she would perhaps be a drag on the ticket come 2024. The Biden campaign, I think, is running a really smart strategy when it comes to how they're going to uh, execute criticizing and critiquing Republicans. They're letting uh, Vice President Harris be the one to execute that case, which is smart, given that she's an, a, form, a former uh, attorney general. She's a former prosecutor. Much like Chris Christie, she understands how to prosecute a case. So letting Joe Biden be above the fray and uh, really talk about the accomplishments and the positive sides while allowing Vice President Harris to really be that attack dog and really prosecute why Republicans are unfit, I think is a really smart move. I think one of the most devastating moments in the debate last night was when Ron DeSantis looked to his left and looked to his right when asked whether or not he would endorse Donald Trump given the indictments. The lack of political courage on the stage, I think, is something that voters will not ignore. So, Sarah, easy, easy one. Um, th there were a lot of surprises. I thought one of, the, one of the surprises for me was to see a very combative Mike Pence. Um, there, um, some of, some of uh, Vivek Ramaswamy's uh, comments were designed to be surprising, but they still were. Um, what, what was it for you? What, what was something that you didn't expect to see last night? There's actually two things. Uh, first of all, Nikki Haley did much better than I thought she was going to going into it. Um, I thought she had a great night. And the other thing is Chris Christie, I thought was gonna have more one-liners and really kind of command the stage. He didn't seem to do that. So that, that surprised me. Those were the two biggest surprises. And Michael, same with you. What were you surprised by last night? I was surprised, one, by Tim Scott. I expected him to have more of a presence on the stage. He is someone who I think Democrats should look out for. He has a positive narration in the way he tells his story and his life experience. And I think, honestly, one thing that Democrats are going to have to really make sure we double down on is ensuring that African-Americans come out to vote. I think with Tim Scott potentially on that ticket, that could be a real threat to Democrats. The other surprise was... Uh, well, like the other guest said, Chris Christie, I expected him to do a better job at prosecuting the case. He was a little slow on his feet to respond. And I think that his annoyance with Vivek really showed. I think the other one was just, let me say, I think Vice President Pence and Vivek reminded me of that Klobuchar, Mayor Pete energy and the annoyance that the VP showed during the debate. All right. Well, um, Sarah, Michael, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been great. Thanks for thank having you. me. Thank you. All right. And that'll do it for us. Thank yeah, you guys for joining you. us today for this post-debate conversation. And keep your eye on thehill.com for more coverage of the 2024 race and other news in politics and policy.